The information in this podcast is educational in general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. The company discussed in this episode was a personal investment of the host and no point to the host invest client accounts or advise clients to invest in this company. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of In the Market Trenches. Uh, this, we're gonna bring you back into our trenches and talk about a story from, uh, from way back when. Uh, before we begin, remember you can check us out on our website at www.accretivewealthpartners.com. We're available anywhere podcasts are available. You can check us out at inthemarkettrenches.podbean.com. You can check us out at snn.network and also the SNN YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash SNN wire. It's a nice shirt you have on. Thank you. <laughs> if you look carefully, this is my podcasting shirt. <laughs> I've noticed that. We, uh, if, you're look, if, you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, we, uh, we're recording two in a row. So we, we are donning the same. We're doing pattern. a double header today. So, um, but yeah, we're gonna take you back and uh, we have a story to tell you again. Um, just to be clear, this was just a moment in time that we were involved in the name. This isn't a reflection of the company or the people involved in the name before we got involved, while we we're involved or after. We just wanna share with you our story and our version of what happened and recount kind of our, our experience. Um, so, what was the experience? What were we involved with? Oh, it was a long experience. <laughs> we, we had owned um, at one point some AMBAC warrants. That uh, and Warrants are typically issued for companies coming out of a restructuring. So uh, if you aren't, any of you, any of the listeners aren't familiar, AMBAC is a company that went through restructuring in the financial crisis. They were a boring, uh, at some point in time, they were a very boring uh, bond, municipal bond insurer. Uh, basically, uh, they had a AAA rating, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they basically, they lent that out to issuers to sort of lower the cost of funding. And the idea is that the bond insurer would step in if a municipal issuer had some form of distress or default and they would make the bondholders good. Uh, that business, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not that business should actually exist in the wild, but we'll put that aside for a second. <laughs> uh, that business was not interesting enough. Uh, so they decided to go into uh, wrapping guarantees on mortgage-backed securities, specifically mortgage-backed, uh, residential mortgage-backed securities. That's right. And that got them into some trouble. And they they wound up wrapping uh, a bunch of bonds from a number of different issuers, uh, several different issuers. Uh, but most, most notable, I would say, is Countrywide Financial, which got, became acquired by Bank of America. Mm -hmm. And at some point in the crisis, they, 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 they screamed no mas, and they... Uh, they went into a bankruptcy restructuring process and uh, emerged, I believe, in 2013. Yep. So they went into the bankruptcy late in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're talking financial crisis here. And then they emerged the first half of 2013. Yeah. And so the first half of 2013, it was the first half of 2013. And, and as part of that, there were warrants up there uh, to buy the stock. Warrants are uh, uh, basically a long term, basically are like a long term call option to buy. Uh, to purchase a share at a specified price. And this was a time when warrants were all over because it's part of the, I think what was the Taxpayer Relief Act, TARP warrants? TARP. Yep. So a lot of financial companies had issued warrants as a part of TARP. So Any, anybody that the Fed, that the Treasury injected money into in the financial crisis, uh, the Treasury got back warrants to buy, buy into, the, into the banks. Yep. So we were very familiar with warrants because we were involved in a number of different TARP warrants, uh, which, believe it or not, most almost all of them have run their course by now, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there uh, might still be one or two hanging out there. There's 2021. One insurance company that I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, anyway, um, it, it's hard to believe it's been that long. Uh, but we were familiar with them from owning some TARP warrants. Uh, maybe we'll do a pod on one of those one day. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, th these were not TARP warrants. These were these were restructuring warrants uh, that were issued to bond bondholders. Uh, and so when they emerged, uh, we got sort of interested in it uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, when we looked at it, uh, we they had a they had a sort of a good bank bad bank structure. They had a lot of uh, legal rights uh, that they were pursuing. 
against a number of different counter counterparties, most notably the big banks. And the, the most notable, most sizable one was uh, Countrywide slash BOA. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to that, just right around the time they emerged, they there was a there was a settlement uh, that so the other monolines also got got involved in doing some of this uh, mortgage-backed security uh, business. And the biggest one was MBIA. Mm -hmm. And they had, um, they avoided restructuring, uh, going through a restructuring process. They were able to avoid it. Um, but they had uh, a case out there against uh, Countrywide. Yep. And remind me, uh, they, they settled with country, Countrywide? They settled with Countrywide for, it was an all cash settlement, 1.6 billion, uh, which was, yeah, that, that was the reaction. Uh, and I, I popping him out of money um, for a settlement. That was huge. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so this is right around the same time that AMBAC had emerged from bankruptcy. So we were kind of looking at the AMBAC situation, uh, what had just happened with one of their competitors, and then the warrants. Well, I think what happened was, I think Country had actually lost in court and then they were going to appeal it and then they settled it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the AMBAC case with Countrywide was going to be heard by the, it was in our view, almost the same fact pattern, um, same claims. They were basically claims when they put these bonds together, there were representations and warranties uh, and, and so uh, that were made. And it was essentially the same, the same case. In our view, in our view. in our non-legal view, yeah. uh, our, our layman view. It was yeah, we're not attorneys, uh, but it was a very, very similar set of set of Cir circumstances. Cir set of circumstances, and it was in front of the same judge, right. and so we felt like that was pretty good, and there was a pretty good chance that there would be a decent, uh, you know, decent proceeds coming in from a settlement, uh, and so we got involved, and we thought. Uh, we thought the book uh, the in the bad bank, um, you know, there was an incentive through the restructuring process to mark that book pretty conservatively, mm -hmm. such that maybe there would be a favorable reversal marks over time. So we thought that that was something that could happen. There was also a sizable tax loss, mm -hmm. um, yep. and that was would have the effect of you know shielding a lot of the earnings that, that they could that that could get generated from uh, theoretically, I think, a business that they would buy. They had the uh, bond ins they had the bond insurance business, which was placed into runoff because nobody's gonna nobody's gonna buy any bonds with them as a wrapper if they're if they're rating if they're not getting, giving anybody any ratings enhancements. So um, you know, essentially, what we had, what we thought we had, was um, you know, basically, I'm gonna call it like a, dis a publicly traded um, sort of distressed fund with. Uh, some some legal claims and a tax loss associated with it. And we thought that was not so bad. We were we were we were pretty we were pretty interested in that. And in 2013, um, you know, we, we got involved with the warrants. The warrants were 10 year warrants, and we thought there was a good chance they got some of these legal things wrapped up within the scope of the 10 years. And some of them they did. There were there were some smaller ones yeah, with other some. banks, mm -hmm. uh, but the big one hanging out there was really the countrywide one. And so. Uh, how do we do we want to talk about that or do we want to talk about the adventure uh, in in the actual uh, bond insurance business and then sort of uh, talk about countrywide either in parallel or after how do you want to do it uh, let's do it in parallel if we can time timeline might be a little fuzzy here. Timeline's a little fuzzy so we were, let's try to do it in parallel we were involved for several years um, <clears throat> and we were you know the so shortly after we got involved, maybe a, maybe a year or so after we got involved, they, AMBAC had done a lot of insurance for uh, various entities in Puerto Rico. And uh, Puerto Rico uh, ran into some trouble with their finances. And so uh, they wound up having to get a whole uh, new uh, sort of law enacted. Uh, Congress had to pass a new law to deal with uh, Puerto Rico's financial distress. Mm -hmm. And so that took time. Uh, we thought that- uh, Coming out of bankruptcy, they had one CEO. When was he had left? Was it he or she? I forget. Oh, it, been, it could have been right. Um, uh, so, so they brought in uh, a restructuring guy that was on their board. Mm -hmm. and we thought he was pretty sharp and pretty good. Um, we, we liked him, but uh, something happened along the way where he was, was forced to leave. 
Uh, I don't remember the events around his departure. I didn't know. They were somewhat mysterious, right? Yeah. Um, but he made a couple of insider purchases along the way, which I thought yeah. was encouraging to see. So the Puerto Rico stuff introduced a lot of volatility into the, into the, into the, into the underlying stock. And um, basically, it, it, it started to trade basically on Puerto Rico news and news of Puerto Rico's solvency and, and whatever else. And um, so that introduced a lot of volatility and an interesting sideshow to what we hoped would be uh, some legal getting getting yeah. this countrywide thing mm-hmm. in the money in the door the marks and the MBS start to reverse themselves and whatever else. Then we have we so we sort of got into this thing and then we have this this high profile um, roller coaster ride of of Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, along the way they did some well, I thought there were some interesting things. Uh, I don't think Puerto Rico is actually resolved at this point. There's still a lot of fighting happening in and around it. Um, they were involved in some of the uh, Puerto Rico at one point to further access the markets, the capital markets had uh, securitized its sales tax receipts. Mm-hmm. And so their biggest exposure was to the sales tax receipts. And those were supposed to be super senior even to the government's GO. Uh, and that there were some maybe questions around whether or not that was actually true. Right. And there were some senior ones that they were, they were involved in. And then there were some junior ones, which I think they were less involved in. Um, and, but they were essentially very, very long-term zeros. Um, so it, it was, let's put it this way, there was a lot going on with the Puerto Rico exposure. At some point in time, they started to buy in some of their exposure in the market, which because right. the, the bonds themselves did not really seem to reflect, assign very much of any value to AMBAX guarantee, AMBAX wrapping. Um, so they, they, I thought that was actually kind of smart of them to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they the even long- started to buy in some of the warrants over time. Oh, they did do some. They had a buyback program in for the warrants. Yeah, Um, and so we mentioned the NOL. Um, We thought they should. We we thought they should have had a share repurchase program while this was going on because there was a lot of volatility in the stock. We did see some insider purchases along the way, uh, among the the the, not the first CEO but the next two CEOs, which we always took as sort of like a, you know, hey, they're putting their money where their mouth is. We like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, now let's run parallel back to. The, litiga- the litigations and what was happening there. So all along the way, we're following sort of the, the countrywide saga. And it's sort of just kind of, be, you know, litigation always takes longer than you think. And so when we got into it in, in 2013, we thought, how long could this go? How long could they drag this on for? They've already, you know, Bank of America had already lost and they'd already settled with MBIA. Mm-hmm. This is essentially, this is a very, very similar case um, in our view. Uh, MBIA, we thought, um, maybe didn't get as much in terms of a settlement as they could have because the, even though they didn't go through a restructuring, uh, their financials were kind of iffy. Uh, and so when, you know, when they were negotiating the settlement, uh, we kind of thought that MBIA might have been a bit of a wounded duck. And so, you know, they might have needed the money. And so uh, con- uh, we didn't think that we didn't think that AMBAC needed the money, so they didn't need to rush to some kind of settlement. And so they thought we thought they might get a slightly we might, we thought they might get a better deal out of it. And if not, they could you know go through the process of going going to court. And, and uh, how long could that take? How long could that take? Well, <laughs> it's 2020. <laughs> this, this first started in 2013. Uh, I think they have a trial schedule. Of the the trial is scheduled for 2021 sometime. Yeah, at this I point. think so. It's been kicked out a few times, so it still re- sort of remains to be seen if it actually happens then. But, you know, so at some point along the way, we just sort of... Yeah, I think we mentioned this in a previous episode. It, time kills all IRRs. And so when we're looking at, you know, what could be the expected return based on various time frames of when a settlement could come in and how that might impact the stock price, you know, there's a target return that you're kind of looking for. And as the time goes on, the return gets lower. And so at a certain point, we just said... Again, I'm not an attorney. We're not attorneys. We don't know how much longer um, this may be delayed, and if it goes to trial, how long does it take to go to the dis- to go the distance and for a judge to ultimately make a decision? And even and even if a decision gets made, then then there's appeals and there's appeal process. So, so it's sort of like we thought these were ten year warrants, and this might get resolved somewhere within their duration of the of the time frame, and that just hasn't happened yet. We still have a few more years to go, so we'll see if it actually happens. I mean, we're not involved. We haven't been involved for quite some time, but uh, for us, it was sort of, 
you know, this, the sideshow of, of, of the Puerto Rico wrappings. And now there's even more because, uh, you know, with sort of the COVID stuff, I mean, COVID sort of rocked the municipal bond market. Right. I mean, if you think about it, like, I mean, we live in New Jersey. Uh, you know, there's, Jersey has turnpike bonds. There's fewer people driving on the turnpike. You know, what do you think that does to the revenues associated with those turnpikes? Like, it just makes, it just it increases the risk for all kinds of different uh, municipal wrappings. So um, we didn't, we, we got, we, we decided we no longer wanted to be involved in this one pre-COVID, but um, quite, I, mean, it was, I think it was quite some time ago at this point, but, you know, it, there, there's just more, all sorts of things just sort of happened to this as, as time went along. It wasn't a very, it wasn't a simple, clean. Uh, so things happened to this, except for the one big thing. The one or two things that, we, that we really this. wanted to happen. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, that was, uh, you know, and, I, and we got really, really familiar along the way with the, the, the accounting of insurance companies. We were reading through the statutory filings and, you know, getting our head around those and reconciling those with the gap file, the gap financials that they were publishing and, you know, the book value and the adjustments to the book value and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, we thought, you know, and at some point in time, they were supposed to buy a business to mm -hmm. actually start to generate <clears> ways, <throat> to, to, ways to use the NOL. And they haven't bought a business to my knowledge yet. No, I don't think so. And so it's, it's just sort of one of those things where, you know, when we got involved, we got involved because, you know, we thought they had, they had a pretty favorable settlement coming. We thought this our MBS book was going to, you know, sort of have some favorable marks to it. And at that point in time, you know, we knew there was some Puerto Rico exposure, but um, we didn't have any concept of what the Puerto Rico adventure could turn into. And the Puerto Rico adventure for them has also been something of a roller coaster ride where the rules of the game sort of have, have, have evolved, even within the context of the law that was passed several times, right? Right. There's been changes in interpretation and then challenges to, the, to this and challenges to that. And it's, it's been... We thought we were getting involved with something that was relatively simple and would play out in a fairly short period of time, and it's turned and it turned into quite the adventure, and nothing nothing really played out the way that we thought it would or should in in in, in any reasonable period of time. So, I think the lesson in this is sort of number one, litigation always takes a lot longer than you think, mm -hmm. and number two, uh, I mentioned that it was questionable whether or not these bond wrappings should exist, the, these bond insurance should exist in the wild. Um, there's been some adventures on that side of the business too. So, you know, the longer you're involved, the more likely it is that these, if you have that kind of thing that's there, something starts to happen, you know, adverse events start to happen on, on that side of things too. So it's been, you know, it was one of those where we learned a lot, I would say. Uh, and mostly, uh, I don't know, what, what, what am I missing? No, that's it. I mean, the saga still continues, but just we're going to be on the sidelines while it happens. You know, it, maybe at some point uh, settlement does come out. I have no idea. Uh, maybe the warrants are going to be around. Maybe they're not. I have no idea. And I still... And maybe uh, Puerto Rico will be resolved and maybe it won't. Again, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have no idea. You know. um, and you know, all that is contingent on you know, what's, the, what's the right value for the underlying if the warrants do exist. It's really tough. I don't know the answer to that. I've, I'm, I'm kind of removed from it from this situation. From this... this yeah. I mean, we reserve all, obviously, we, we, we could always go back and revisit it at some point and, uh, you know, but uh, I think we had enough brain damage on this one for, uh, the return on invested brain damage was, was very low. <laughs> and I actually think it might've been the, well, the loss in terms of invested brain damage is, uh, you know, uh, anyway, it was not an enjoyable experience. We learned some things. And, but we learned a lot. Um, and so hopefully you learned something too. Uh, we can, is that a wrap? Anything else you want to add? Land the plane. Land the plane? Land the plane. All right. We'll get you home so you can change your shirt. Uh, wonderful. Uh, remember, check us out on our website, www.creativewealthpartners.com. You can check us out anywhere podcasts are available. We're also available in the market trenches at podbean.com. You can check us out at snn.network or on the SNN YouTube channel. at youtube.com slash SNN wire. That's it for now. Wrap it up. Just if uh, you can rate and review us, it helps. And uh, if you have an interesting story that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. So don't be shy about reaching out. Thanks very much, everyone. Talk to you soon. Take care.
The information in this podcast is educational in general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.